I want to tell you a story this morning in uh, two chapters. Uh, The first chapter is about challenge and despair, uh, and the second chapter is about hope and opportunity. I also want to talk about the way in which information technology can help bridge and take us from chapter one to chapter two. Chapter one really has only three pictures I want to share with you. The first is that eight is actually the percent of Cleveland residents who actually have a college degree. One in three is a story of the reality for one in three women in Cleveland who have type 2 diabetes. 57 is our story of poverty, but interestingly enough, not in the city of Cleveland, but in our suburbs. This is a story of challenge and despair that actually is not unique to Cleveland. In fact, obviously, many of you from this part of Michigan know all about those. What should universities do who are actually in the middle of these realities? Many universities have traditionally and oftentimes by design chosen to actually be apart distinct, with very high walls between themselves and the communities around them. This goes back 800 years, and as I say, much of it by design, much of it by choice, to be elite, to be exclusionary, to be able to take the time necessary to tell the rest of the world what can be done, what should be done. At Case Western Reserve University, we decided a decade ago to try rather deliberately to reject that 800-year tradition and uh, embrace a very different kind of strategy at Case Western Reserve, which was really to contribute to a revitalization um, of our city, uh, to actually engage with the community around us, to work leveraging technology from the university through commercialization and tech transfer, and really try to bridge the digital divide through a series of projects in which we leverage technology to really address the priorities of the community around us. We began eight years ago a first project in which partnering with Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, the Cleveland Clinic, and the Cleveland Metropolitan School District delivering directly into school rooms, open heart surgeries for AP biology students in schools that had no AP biology, while surgeons were actually doing surgery, interacting in real time with students, providing the information technology infrastructure required to get us there, and providing the curriculum and the support for both Cleveland Metropolitan Schools and working in partnership with the civic engagement team from the Cleveland Clinic. What emerged from that was a project called One Community, and I want to very briefly share with you, as we really talk about opportunity, what the information technology community in Cleveland has really been engaged in over these last eight years. Really an attempt to create a very large partnership a partnership that involves all of the schools, K-20, to all over our region, some 800 now. All of the economic and government agencies, city, region, federal agencies, all around Northeast Ohio. Working with all of the museums and libraries that are in our community. Working with all the research facilities, both at the university um, and, um, and across, across the region. The One Community is really a framework that we created eight years ago, a nonprofit framework, which is its own 501c3. It's our own innovation incubator. The umbrella is actually all about collaboration enabled through advanced information technology to actually engage with our research community 
and to actually engage with the community as well. That's not an or statement, that's an and both statement. And that's deliberate. So, eight years ago I began One Community by taking my internet check and passing it over the table. A university gave away its power to control its destiny, as at least us IT people think about IT, and gave it away to a nonprofit organization that we helped create with the city of Cleveland. Fast forwarding eight years later, today one community actually operates in 24 counties all across Northeast Ohio. We have a series of initiatives that provides capacity building for our community, again attending to both the community's priorities and those of a great research university. Working together, we've actually initiated a uh, $10 million uh, project funded by the stimulus funds to actually work with our housing authorities, that is to say neighborhood housing authorities, working with our community technology centers in actually providing skills to 10,000 households over around the region uh, together uh, to actually not only provide them with certification of completion, but with it comes technology upon completion, that is to say a computer, and with that also comes two years of broadband connected to one community, our community internet service provider, our community network, our community investment in our future. We also have received a fairly significant, about an $11 million uh, fund from the FCC to do rural health care around uh, Cleveland, connecting not only our great health care assets in the city of Cleveland, all part of one community's first effort, some 75 health care facilities now interconnected to each other, creating all kinds of value related to patient care and back office efficiencies, but now exporting and making possible outstanding health care through the rural communities, through telehealth and telemedicine activity, as well as the sharing of electronic medical records for when, in fact, rural patients need to come into the city. We're also providing wireless connectivity, open, free, wireless connectivity everywhere there is a major public sector institution Today there are some, as you'll see, 2,000, what was two, the city of Cleveland and Case Western Reserve University, today some 2,000 facilities all over northern Ohio are connected to one community and at Case Western Reserve and University Circle, in downtown Akron, at the, at the uh, airport, one community provides free public Wi-Fi connectivity to travelers, neighbors, students, and the like. And just uh, about a year ago, we received a very substantial investment to scale and replicate our One Community Initiative in Cleveland to 24 counties in northern Ohio. In fact, the investments that One Community received through ARRA, the stimulus funds, if you add them all up, was equal to those of Case Western Reserve University about $70 million. Again, an investment in our future, an investment in a future which the community itself can build, in which partnership and collaboration is the framework enabled by next generation advanced information technology. So just to give you one or two very short examples of this kind of activity. I referenced that first project that we, we did eight years ago with the Cleveland Clinic uh, and the Cleveland Schools and one community. The Cleveland Clinic, like all great healthcare institutions, has a civic engagement strategy. And I don't have to describe the traditional ones. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with them. But working together with the innovation leadership at the Cleveland Clinic, we asked them to do something totally different. We asked them to actually invest in, in putting in the ground 
advanced fiber optics to 800 schools in Northeast Ohio. It took us a while to tell the story, but this was about delivering the best healthcare education in environments in which basically healthcare education had fallen off the curriculum because there wasn't funding, there wasn't specialized knowledge, textbooks were 10 and 12 years old. And so together we actually uh, worked to first build out the infrastructure, then we worked on getting an executive team in to actually build the curriculum together. Then we worked on actually the funding uh, of the uh, video conferencing infrastructure for all of these schools across the region. And today, uh, the Cleveland Clinic delivers every day um, healthcare education, wellness education directly uh, into the schools uh, around uh, northern Ohio. Uh, and again, what we've done is uh, try to uh, partner and leverage that relationship um, not only to do healthcare, but now to do student assessments, to get technology into students' hands. Just yesterday in Cleveland, we actually announced the first in the nation, we believe, comprehensive 6 through 12 e-textbook initiative launching e-readers and the entire HMH, Huff Mifflin Harcourt curriculum, largely a continuation of the story of engagement and partnership across the community. So today, in terms of that eight-year journey, we really have about 2,000 sites now all connected together at blinding speeds in a community asset. This is not a leased arrangement. This is not a rental arrangement. We own our own destiny because we own our own infrastructure, a story that we know all over this country and especially in this region. We've also attracted a significant amount of investment, and we've also had, we think, demonstrable uh, impact on recruiting new jobs, new entrepreneurs, and new startups who want to work in this environment where institutions are connected one uh, to the other. So that's really kind of the story for the last eight years, and I want to kind of shift gears for, if you will, kind of where we are today and where we're going. So I've spent the first 10 minutes describing for you basically how to how information technology partners can build out the infrastructure required to innovate and deliver core services to institutional partners, schools, museums, libraries, governments, universities, healthcare facilities. But one of the most important things that information technology people can tell and work with everyone on is the logic of what happens next. And we decided that it wasn't enough just to build a 2,000 facility, community network infrastructure, the largest of its kind in the world. The next project is actually to figure out how to get that blinding speed highways to be byways and ultimately to neighborhoods. And in fact, not only to neighborhoods, but right to the front door of people who live in Cleveland. And so we launched a program two years ago called the Case Connection Zone with many of the same partners that eight years ago we began the journey of one community, working together to actually propose the nation's first gigabit fiber to the home research project. The notion that we had was what difference could blinding speed connectivity make to the quality of life in Cleveland? And we ended up focusing through an iterative process using a methodology that's associated with our Weatherhead School of Management called Appreciative Inquiry, engaging with our neighbors, and identified four areas that were of concern to them. Not surprisingly, because it would be the same in this community, neighborhood safety, number one. Number two, if one out of every three women has type 2 diabetes, and there are a whole series of other chronic disease challenges in our communities that, again, you, you know about, the second highest priority has to do with health and wellness. The third priority, adults 
grandparents alike, as well as children, are concerned about the children's education and their future. And Cleveland is a healthcare economy. And yet, only 8% of our kids go on to and finish college, and our failure rate, our rate to, to, uh, to fail to complete our science Ohio graduation is 74%. So, rightly so, the community is concerned about STEM education. And finally, like here, it's cold in Cleveland, and money gets spent on energy. And energy management is a huge issue that the community identifies. So we chose to actually take those community priorities and start asking our researchers at the universities what pieces and parts they'd like to pick up on and turn into research projects. And that's the story of the impact of local fiber along the way. So we lit up in May of last year following the release of the country's first national broadband plan, a project that we'd been working on and that was announced in the national broadband plan, which is called the Case Connection Zone, right in the middle of Cleveland. The first 104 homes fully wired up with unprecedented symmetrical gigabit. What's that mean for those of you who are not proud propeller heads like myself? What, the, what that means is something on the order of 200 to 400 times faster broadband that I can get in the, in the actual um, suburbs. The question is, to what end? To what end? What, what difference would it make? What could we do? And we all know how amazing we've been able to design and create value using handhelds with, on a good day, you know, 384 kilobits per second. That's what design teams do. That's what innovators do. Constraint is an enormously important part of design. And what happens, we challenged, what happens when you actually remove the constraints, when the abundance is the underlying operative when it comes to broadband. That is the project that we're engaged in right now, and all 104 homes are part of our, our living lab uh, that is underway in our community. And I kid you not, this is just from the other day, from inside the, uh, one of the homes uh, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, for those of you who, who do know something, uh, on a very, very good day in my neighborhood, I can get four megabits down in the suburbs. Most of the time, it's dot four. This is the lived reality. This is the lived reality. And importantly, because we don't think the Internet of the future is about a spectator sport. It's all about interaction. It's all about engagement. Also, the uploads. That is today, the interaction that can happen both from home as well as from the second location is enormously important. And I did these tests because I knew I was coming here, so I wanted to ping these cities along the way. That is the fastest residential broadband in America by factors. We also have, when you want to come visit us in Cleveland, when Nancy comes back to visit the Buckeye State, uh, you can come visit us. I'll treat you to a cup of coffee, and you can come visit us in our executive briefing center that we've set up along the way. Uh, and for us, it's all about the apps it's all about our faculty, our graduate students, and our students, undergraduates. Our undergraduate students are engaged, as I'll share with you in just a second, as are our graduate students, our faculty, our postdocs, in working in these four core clusters that the neighborhood defined for us, but which are so easily aligned to what great research institutions do. And really working in, I'll give you a very, I mean, I'm going to focus in just for a minute or two on some of the healthcare applications because it seems relevant to this community that, I'm, uh, that we're working with today. And so really, the overall effort is to create a smart, connected health and wellness environment to all of the homes uh, that are, are lit up right now uh, along the way, and really focusing in on three kinds of use cases. The first is actually focusing on wellness, not on disease, but about wellness, and trying to turn all those homes into smart homes that can actually help both the residents, the children, the grandparents, and the parents actually monitor their own health in real time, their own wellness 
program in real time, as well as communicate the relevant vitals through the smart house over this huge broadband connectivity to the EMR and other related requirements in the healthcare space. And so we have all kinds of devices and sandboxes for household members to play with and then to, to engage both with their children who are studying diet in high school, putting together grandparents and, and grandchildren, programs for, uh, for diet and the like, uh, as well as uh, pedometers uh, and other uh, related uh, devices. All of those are gathering and being presented, displayed inside the home in innovative ways using innovative displays, as well as uh, being able to record them uh, online uh, through uh, a number of different electronic medical record projects that are out there. The second use case is actually around chronic disease uh, management. And again, a kind of interesting set of challenges. We've equipped these homes with high definition video conferencing gear, not the ones that cost $20,000. These are the ones that we've actually innovated with our students, faculty, and staff at $200. And provides real time consultative opportunities that happen every day between uh, patients in this community from two slightly elderly ladies who are, have early onset Alzheimer's to a young man who has autism, who are in real time, every day, interacting with the entire ecosystem of family and healthcare providers. The third is actually coming from a national study that one of my colleagues, Dr. Dor Dearborn, is working on an environmental sensing technology, is interested in environmental health and the air quality particulates inside an inner city environment in which the steel industry that polluted our neighborhoods continues 25 years later after the steel is gone to continue to pollute the health of people around us. He has a national study. And now these houses are, have sniffing devices that are both good for everything for chronic disease management as well as uh, working on uh, the challenges of simply attending to uh, the needs to correct uh, the air quality uh, in the homes around us. This is a picture of a resident. She's on both sides of her are her grandsons. She has type 2 diabetes. She has a, a, a pressure cuff that's talking in real time to the little device in front of her that's talking to the house. She's on her porch. That HD video conferencing infrastructure is connected by wire back into the home. She does this routinely during the nice weather. Otherwise, she's in her home doing this. And she's talking, in this case, to Dr. Sadler, uh, who is a, uh, a diet specialist at Metro Health in Cleveland. Uh, and her kids, these two grandchildren, are actually, uh, as it turns out, when we took this picture, both working on a health, uh, health module in their high school class. And for them, that made it very re real and relevant. That was their reported efficacy. And for their grandma, it actually was about better health care outcomes because in a video that I will be playing for you, um, I could share with you her feedback, which is she felt it was more intimate. She felt it was more easier to get to. No standing in the Cleveland winter to the bus to get to the health care facility, to wait in the waiting room, to get turned around, to go to get take tests, to get back into the winter, to get back on the bus to go home. This all happens in real time every day that she needs it. So I won't go through the other use cases today, but we are studying, we are working on STEM education. We are working on interactions, as I've shared, uh, from within the surgical suite, interactively. We are working on, uh, working on uh, energy management uh, activities, both in terms of the demand side, that is, say, from the uh, inside the home, uh, as well as uh, from the supply side, which is to say, how do you create models of ways in which we can create smart grids that can be dynamically provisioning power around our community, coming from our faculty of engineering, these projects. And so just to sort of summarize, you know, what, what I've tried to share with you this morning, uh, really a story about partnership, really a story about taking challenge and despair and turning it into op opportunity and hope by mostly creating partnerships, uh, working across traditional silos, uh, and, and now one of the most exciting things to share with you is that 
uh, this project, the Case Connection Zone, uh, has actually uh, become the proof point for a 37 research university partnership across the nation called GIGU, gig.u, attempting to replicate and scale the activity, uh, and US Ignite, which is another project that is just about to be launched by the Office of Science Technology in the White House. These are exciting new developments that are going on. I want to leave you with two slides, two images. We made a demonstration in June of never before seen technology projects. The first slide is in the humanity space. You'll be hearing fantastic stories later in the morning and afternoon about other amazing uh, drama work. This is a picture of two dancers and an original uh, choreographed piece of work in which we had uncompressed HD video, 3D shooting, and holographic technologies. In other words, these two dancers were not dancing in the same space. And the audience, like yourselves, who watched the one dancer on stage had no idea that the second dancer wasn't there. That's uncompressed video with 3D giving you depth and holographic technology making the second dancer on stage. And the last slide is we're doing it with healthcare as well in medicine. This is uh, Warren Selman and Andy Sloan. Some of you may know Warren Selman, chief of neurology at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. Andy Sloan is a colleague. This is a open uh, brain surgery uh, project called Surgical Theater. It uses the same uncompressed video. In this case, it runs at one gigabit per second. From home, Dr. Sloan or Dr. Selman can actually and do uh, take a look at patient-specific CT scans with 3D glasses and haptic devices, which allows them to practice their open brain surgeries the night before, the morning of, their surgery before they get in together, even though it's not easy for both of them to be at the same place at the same time. So I hope I've given you something to think about. I hope I, 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 hope I provoked you a little bit. And mostly, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much.